and welcome everyone on the recording as well. I'm very excited to welcome you all to our first guest lecture presentation in this ramp series, where we're going to be looking at regenerative agriculture principles and practices with the, I don't even know what describing word to use, Lorraine, phenomenal, amazing, intelligent Lorraine Gordon. Um, I will just start by uh, taking a moment to acknowledge country and acknowledge the Bundjalung Nation, where I live, work and play, and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging and any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. So it is with great pleasure that I will hand straight over to Lorraine Gordon. Lorraine Gordon's um, immense experience and career in agriculture has made a massive impact on what we're doing in Australia in terms of regenerative agricultural practices and principles. Uh, Lorraine has, I'm sure she won't mind me sharing, just submitted her PhD for examination where she's been doing some amazing work. And I'm sorry, I can't remember the long title, Lorraine, but maybe you want to speak a little bit to that, but has really been um, pioneering regenerative agriculture in Australia along along with um, you know, our, our mentors and uh, many others. Um, but it is my pleasure to welcome you, Lorraine, and I'll hand over to you now. Thank you, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Simone. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for the lovely introduction. Uh, anyway, this week, uh, I guess I'm paying Simone through Southern Cross Uni for, to say those things, so I can uh, <laughs> thank you for those lovely words. Um, Yes, well, I'm going to put I'm going to share my screen in a minute, but I just wanted to say that I'm going to come at this presentation from a few different angles. Um behind what I'm presenting is of course a lot of research, a lot of um academia work, but I don't present that way. I'm very pragmatic. Um what I'm showing you is really my experience of some 38 years of a, um, of being a farmer and a farmer that started off in a very conventional form of farming and has gone through a very long journey to get, to, I guess, where I am today. So just bear with me while I share my screen. Start slideshow. Okay, how's that look? Can we all see that? Yes, that's great, Lorraine. Thank you. Fabulous. Okay, so first and foremost, um, I'm a carbon farmer and a cattle trader. Um, I'll take that further. I'm a regenerative cattle trader. Well, I, I like to think I am, but by no means have I got this journey perfect. And I think um, one of the reasons I'm so attracted to agriculture in particular, but even more so with the regener regenerative journey is that you actually never reach an end point. Every day is different. There are oodles of challenges. Um, no scenario is ever the same and you never stop learning. And I think that's the most important thing to remember. And uh, the easiest thing to do is just to take this journey step by step so obviously, as Simone has outlined um, briefly, I, I, I do wear a few other hats um, and uh, I have had a, a wonderful journey with Southern Cross University heading up the Regen Ag Alliance, the Farming Together program and uh, all sorts of interesting things around our state decarb hub and our national um, well, they started as drought hubs and then they became innovation hubs and uh, Anyway, there's hubs everywhere in Australia doing all sorts of good work. That's the, the important message there. So just a little bit of um, background here. I, I uh, farm with my three sons. Uh, the oldest is an academic in the space, in the regen space now, working out of Oregon State University. The youngest has actually just taken up a carpentry apprenticeship and the middle one, um, all with lots of lovely smiles there. Uh, Seth is our farm manager on our farm. 
And uh, this is our beautiful farm. We're located at Ebor, at Point Lookout, to be exact. And as far as I know, we are the highest cattle farm in the country. Um, we're at about 15, between 1,450 and 1,550 metres above sea level. We have, we're blessed with whatever a normal um, seasonal rainfall is, but around average of a 2,000 millimetre rainfall <clears throat> on basalt soils. And we turn off anywhere between um, 700 and 1,000 steers in any one year. So we buy them in around 275 kilos and turn them off anywhere from 500 to 600 kilos for the MSA grass fed market. So that's our background. And I know some of you will be on this screen not knowing who I've got on the um, on the Zoom, but we'll be thinking, well, that's all very easy when you have a blessed with a farm at Ebor with such a high rainfall and great soils. But let me tell you, it makes it harder. It actually makes things far more challenging. Um, and that's uh, because whilst you're seeing pasture growing and trees growing, so are all the other um, not so uh, not so good things growing as well, such as high worm counts, um, diseases, weeds, uh, blackberries, liver fluke, and all the other sorts of things that can come with those sorts of conditions. So the challenges are always there. So like I said, um, this is what we do. We're not into any particular breed. I apologize for all the black uh, cattle on the screen, but we basically take young cattle, put kilos on them and turn them off at the other end to the premium grass fed market. And hopefully into the future, uh, which we're working at the moment into a regen, <clears throat> a regen market, a reg a spe uh, specifically a regen product. So that's what we do. And uh, of course, we I'll go through some of the things that we do and we use these cattle to sequester carbon. So the theory behind that is that we look after our soil. The soil looks after the pastures. The pastures look after the cattle and the cattle look after us. And so carbon is at the forefront of what we do, which is a completely... Uh, it's, it's another, that's another presentation for another day, but I will touch on it slightly. So just going back in the history of where this has all come from, this was the farm, I guess, when I took it over about 38 years ago. So you can see the cattle look pretty wild there. Well, they were, they'd been running through that sort of wild country for years and weren't too happy about being taken out of that gorge country. And you can also see that's um, a very overgrazed native pasture that I'm dealing with um, and some pretty tough conditions to try and turn that around into a profitable enterprise, coupled with the fact that that's actually in the neighbours' cattle yards and we didn't have any fencing across what was then about 6,000 acres, um, no fencing, no yards and no facilities whatsoever. So it took about two years to actually find that cash flow in those cattle and actually get them to the market. So I just want to show you these photos because it does show um, how the paddocks were very overgrazed. Even though the cattle really had the run of the mill, um, they would stick to the sweeter areas and really flog them. Uh, and you can just see that by what that pasture looks like there. I mean, still got 100% ground cover, but um, very overgrazed. Now, these are comparison on comparison photos, which I just love. Um, and same paddocks. And you can see that this is transitioning now. And this is transitioning purely through hooved animals. So I just want to state that. Back in the early days, we did try and compete with our conventional neighbours. And I literally, you know, sucked up all their knowledge and did exactly what they told me to do. Um, but of course, I was on a treadmill of going nowhere to try and compete with families that had been on improved properties for generations, had plenty of, of dosh, plenty of money to spend. I had no cash and no income. And so it took me some time to realise that this just was not going to be a sustainable direction 
for me to try and start A, clearing trees like they told me to do and B, then try and improve these paddocks with imp um, 100% improved pastures when I didn't actually have any fencing infrastructure in place um, to speak of anyway. So it wasn't long before I could clearly see that it was not going to be um, a sustainable path moving forward and that I would quickly go broke. So again, a comparison photo, same paddock, um, the one on, I don't know if that's your right or left, um, it's on my right, is, um, you know, you can see some green pig coming through, overgrazed, uh, and then to what it is today. And again, that has not been planted, that pasture. Um, it is actually a mixture of uh, ryegrass, coxfoot, fescue, uh, or a number of different clovers, marcu lotus, uh, and on all sorts of, of goodies. And the improved seeds have really come in with the livestock. And so uh, I believe now we have quite a nice balance in our pastures. Again, more comparison photos there. You can see there's a lot of um, what we call poetusic in those old photos, very unpalatable in that stage. That's very much a stage three grass and uh, not very tasty to the animals at all um, unless it's burnt. They actually love it when it's been had a fire go through it and they come up with black faces covered in charcoal. And uh, that's the only time they really want to eat that stuff. But the problem is um, Poetusic loves to be burnt. And the more you burn it, the thicker it becomes. So uh, there is some management around, around those native pastures. So back in the day, what we used to do is we'd go down and muster our cattle out of the gorge country. And the old timers taught me back then that, you know, when you leave to bring the cattle out of the gorges and up to the highlands in the spring, Make sure you drop a match behind you and burn the country ready for next year's graze. So for years I used to go down there with the old timers and on our horses we'd be flicking the matches off the back of the horse. I'd get thrown into jail for doing that today. But that was standard practice. Every year we'd flick the match, burn 50,000 hectares of wilderness ready to take cattle down there um, the following winter for the winter and there would always be green pick. And for at least 20 years, we never had any severe fires. Um, they would be a really cool burn fire that would just burn slowly through the bushland. Uh, the trees would be kept intact and just um, take a lot of the bulk out of the country and freshen it up for not only uh, the cattle that would be taken down into the gorge country, but also for the wildlife, you know, for the, the kangaroos and the marsupials and, uh, um, and so forth. So there would be fresh pick for everyone. And uh, that was just standard practice. And then we were told we weren't allowed to do that anymore, which was a shame um, because I think, you know, given what, and, and again, this is another lecture around I guess, resilience and fires. But given what we experienced in 2019, which, quote, was the worst fires in living history, um, is very much a consequence of not only a changing climate, but also the fact that those cool burns had not been done in that country for a very long time and were shunned upon. And when we burnt that country, we used to burn it uh, really in October, you know, in the cooler months before summer hit. So that's how we could get those nice, cool mosaic burns. And again, that that uh, was standard, standard First Nations practice and Indigenous practice. So interesting times. And then, you know, we start to see what happened to our country in 2019, getting sandwiched between two massive fires, the East Cat Eye Fire coming up the Gorge Country from the coast, um, and the bees nest fire going through Guy Fawkes National Park. So, you know, a combination of those two elements coming together and bad management. That's our little village burning. Managed to save the pub, but 
you know, it, uh, this is probably the one thing we shouldn't have saved, but we did save the farm. Anyway, moving on. As a consequence of those fires, of course, you know, we've got all sorts of issues that, to be honest, I hadn't experienced until the last five years ever before in my 38 years farming in this particular area. And that is uh, some particular species of trees not responding, not coming back after such a hot fire. Um, particular trees like banksias and some eucalypts certainly uh, won't be coming back. Of course, there are some young stuff, as you can see, the their bushland is um, regenerating, but some species will not return. Never have we ever had a problem with feral pigs. The feral pigs always stayed in Cathedral Rocks National Park. That's where they lived. That's where they really didn't belong, but that's where they stayed. Well, the fires flushed them all out onto the nearby farmlands, and now we all have massive issues with feral pigs. In fact, that's an issue across the state right now and out of control. Um, and, of course, mice plagues. Again, that's just, you know, that's the environment completely out of kilter trying to adjust itself and everybody trying to find where they fit um, in the scheme of things. So you know things are out of balance when you're starting to see pictures like that. And, of course, as you all know, on the back of the worst fires, well, the worst drought, the worst fires, we ended up with the most horrendous flooding and that's the Dorigo Mountain. That's our access to the farm for some of my staff coming up from the coast. So it was ended up a, a three and a half hour journey through back forestry roads to try and even reach the farm. So what I'm here to talk about is what is regenerative agriculture. And the first thing I do want to say about that is it does mean different things to different people depending on where you are on your journey. And when we talk to our students at Southern Cross University about Regen Ag, we get them to come up with their own definition at the beginning of their, their course and then revisit it at the end of their studies. And it's always a different definition. And that's because they are emerging in their knowledge of what regenerative agriculture is and what it isn't. I've put up a few definitions there for you um, to have a look at. Um, they're all great definitions. There are lots of good definitions, and I don't believe there should be just one definition for Regen A, even though in this space everybody wants to put us in a box um, like they have done with all the other practices, you know, and say it is this, it's not that. Um, and this is what Regen Ag is, or we even get uh, we get criticism of not having a definition for Regen Ag. Um, anyway, that's what it is. Uh, you can see I'm a I'm, like I said I'm very pragmatic. I have a very simple definition. Uh, if I look at it now with an academic perspective, it probably wouldn't cut it, but I still like it leaving the environment and our landscape in a better state than we found it. Um, and that's just easy to remember as far as I'm concerned. Of course, here's my son's definition. Um, far better academic than I am, has to have far more words on the page to say what he needs to say, but it is excellent. Um, I'll just read the bottom part. Regenerative agriculture has emerged as an umbrella term for any agricultural activity that restores and enhances holistic resilient systems it can include many old and new practices. An agricultural practice is not regenerative when it discourages the evolutionary and self-organising potential of a living system. And we'll unpack what that actually means. But what we are talking about is a complex adaptive system, a system that constantly adapts itself to its environment um, and can emerge in a different state than where it started. So there you go, some definitions of regen agriculture. So now I want to move into an area that I'm particularly focused on, and um, that is the principles. And can I say that one of my 
pet aggravations is to see, and particularly I see this a lot in the corporate world, is when they get principles and practices all muddled up. They put, uh, a lot of corporates um, do this, they will put up their principles for Regen Ag, and all it is is a list of particular practices that suit whatever product they're trying to flog. And so I guess be beware um, of what I think is a lot of greenwashing out there, and particularly in the Regen space. The wonderful thing about the Regen space, and I'm very happy about this, is it's fastly becoming mainstream agriculture. Um, you know, it's now starting to replace the word sustainable. In reality, they're very similar. I guess the word sustainable agriculture uh, to a younger generation doesn't depict um, restoring landscapes uh, to the point where young people want to see things fixed. They want to see our landscapes repaired. They're not happy with status quo. So we need to be really clear about the differences between principles and practices. So principles are there to guide us. Practices come and go. As our knowledge of caring for our landscapes increases, and as we go on to higher levels of understanding of how ecology works, then our practices will change. And a, an example of that is years ago we talked about minimum till. Um, now we talk about no kill, no till, no till, no kill. So we're emerging in our ability to put certain practices into place that restore and enhance our landscapes better than the way we used to um, look after landscapes. So our practices will constantly change, but principles tend to stay pretty well fixed. And they're there, I guess, to guide us in the decisions we make in our particular landscapes. And they are broad enough to be able to guide us. Um, I guess you could say they're like the Ten Commandments, except these principles may well change in the future, but for now they are a good guide. So let's just unpack what they actually mean. So the first one, and, and I must say this, this work, um, I'll just tell you a little bit about how these particular principles came about. Um, part of my research encompassed looking at all of the principles around regenerative agriculture globally. So what were the other countries saying were the principles around regen ag? And then bringing them back into an Australian context, because in Australia, I think one of the things we've done very badly is just copy other countries as far as looking after landscapes. And so, for instance, the European way of farming has really not done us any favours with our old, very old landscapes and soils that we have in Australia. And so we needed to take the principles that were out there um, around the world and then test them against um, Australian conditions, Australian, what, how Australian farmers and land managers, um, you know, saw their landscapes and their relationship with landscapes. And hence through quite an extensive process and a massive consultation process, these are the seven principles that we came up with. So the first one is be, ecological lit lit be ecologically literate, think holistic and understand complex adaptive systems. So that's understanding that our landscapes are constantly emerging and changing form. And I guess it's a survival technique in, in ecology that when the conditions change, so do the species change. And so do humans change with conditions. So when we start to think about climate change, for instance, it's really about us evolving with a changing climate. We already accept, most of us, that it is going to be a much hotter planet to live on. So as humans, we need to know how do we work with our landscapes and evolve with what is a changing climate. And so when you think of things holistically, 
instead of looking at things down a microscope and saying, well, that's the answer, you're stepping back um, and you're looking at all of the complex relationships that go into to a changing landscape. You still need to be able to dive into the microscopic world and have a look at things close up. But the important issue here is you need to be able to step back. You know, it's like seeing the the uh, forest for the wood, what is it, or for the trees type um, approach. So the two go hand in hand. I must say that there is always space for that reductionist analyzing but it needs to be seen in the context of the whole and so to be able to think holistically is that ability to step out step back and question what is going on with this picture or what is wrong with this picture and then I guess knowing who do I go and speak to um, to get more information around this picture so being able to, to understand there's some very complex relationships in ecology that are constantly unfolding. So we can't control that because the moment we try and control or stop a system from evolving, then we will lose and we will go broke. So the key here, the key message is to work with that constantly evolving, uh, evolving system, not work against it. Because at the end of the day, there's a great st saying, and I give credit, this is a Terry McCosker saying, that we need Mother Nature, but she doesn't need us. We are quite disposable. Whereas things like bees are not. Without bees, we're all screwed. That's the bottom line. So we need to put things in context. Which leads to the next one, see your landscape as a community that you belong to and work with. We are just another species on planet Earth. We are nothing special. Um, in the eyes of Mother Earth, we are nothing special at all. We are just another species. So we need to learn to be able to farm differently, to adapt uh, if we're going to feed feed people and survive and be sustainable into the future, we need to, to move with what is going on with nature. Acknowledge and consider diverse ways of working with landscapes. There are many, many different perspectives and discourses when it comes to managing landscapes. The more perspectives that we can get, the more opinions that we can get, well, that is where the challenges can be addressed. That's how we, we address what they call wicked problems. If we only ask the opinions of those that all have the same knowledge base, then we are really doing ourselves an injustice. So what I mean by that is we need to bring in First Nations conversations about managing landscape. We need to bring in the old timers that have been doing it forever and that know, you know, this season's going to be late because this... Um, this particular insect hasn't hatched, you know, all of that sort of knowledge. We need their natural resource management groups uh, with their, you know, science expertise. We need academics. We need, we need all of those different perspectives if we are going to approach a challenge um, head on and actually get somewhere with it making a difference. Understand that human cultures are co-evolving with their environments um, that people and landscapes are relational, are relational, okay, so that we're part of it. Engage with First Nations people, that's very um, obvious. Remain curious, seek trans transformative experiences and continuous learning. That is really important. Um, and that is why I always say you actually never get to the end point in the regen world because you're on this continuous knowledge spiral of higher level understanding and learning. And you never stop learning because the moment you think you know it all and that you've got all of the answers is the moment you're gonna be blown off your perch. Okay, so what you're doing, being part of this mentoring program is a classic example. 
And part of my research showed that regenerative farmers do far more continuous learning than conventional farmers. So it's very much a part of their psyche to be able to continually learn from other farmers, from other groups, from anywhere they can. They suck up knowledge like a sponge. And that's that's important. Engage in ecological renewal and make place-based decisions through monitoring. So that's about monitoring what is going on in this landscape. Look for things for changes and act quickly. So be aware that the answers um, to one problem may well be found somewhere else, but that answer may not be the same for every bioregion. And that particular practice, when we get to practices, may not be the practice that you should use in your particular circumstances in your particular bioregion. So courses for courses. Uh, we need to solve, well, address some of these challenges um, on a bioregion by bioregion basis um, with lots of diverse knowledge. Okay, so now let's look at practices. This is just a list. It's not the list it's not the only list um, but it's a starting point for you guys to get your head around what are regenerative practices and what probably doesn't constitute regen practices so inputs um organic compost and bio amendments are a good one be careful of organic compost um compost have been put out there as the bee's knees of everything but be careful what you're bringing in to a bioregion, what's in that compost? Is it actually registered? Um, because you can bring in a lot of problems into an environment if that's not clean compost. And in addition to that, you can bring in microbes that your existing microbial population doesn't like. And you can actually cause what they call microbe wars. So Again, you know, you need to unpack that. If you can make your own compost, that's great. On scale, compost is hard to get out. And so then we look at things like compost teas. Can I say when we talk about bio amendments um, and reducing or ceasing synthetic chemical inputs, that doesn't mean you don't put inputs into your pastures. Now, what I tend to do, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, I'll talk about what we do at our farm, is we like to get our chemistry of our soil as be as right as we can. So we, we do a lot of soil testing to correct the chemistry of the soil so that we can encourage microbial activity and then let the microbes do all the work for us. I'll talk a bit more about that. Grazing management. Um, there, What we talk about here is holistic grazing. But that can encompass, just so not to make it confusing, time-controlled grazing. It used to be one time we called it cell grazing. You know, there's been a few different names for this, but basically it's about adequate rest periods for pasture to recuperate and to, to photosynthesize and to grow and trying to keep our pastures in what we call like a phase two stage. Um, now I can see we've got Brian on here who is far more, much more of an expert when it comes to holistic management than I am uh, and uh, does some fantastic courses on holistic management. But basically it's about having ideally one mob of cattle and moving them quickly across a landscape which encourages photosynthesis, speeds up pasture growth, and understand there is a symbiotic relationship with healthy pastures and hooved animals. So grazing management is key. And we have literally tripled our stocking rates over the years from getting our grazing management right. It is our number one, I can't stress this enough, it is our number one tool. A few other things on there, uh, stress-free stockmanship, et cetera. Self-herding is another one, very uh, appropriate, particularly on big stations in the outback um, where it's just not possible to have smaller paddocks 
and um, be able to move cattle across those smaller paddocks. Anyway, moving on, I don't want to go over time. Biodiversity, biodiversity, biodiversity. I can't say that word enough. The more, the better. I don't give a rat's what species of grasses I really have in my paddock as long as I have plenty of them. Because in the drought, uh, having a mixture of native and improved pastures is what saved us. Those native pastures have been used to dry, hot conditions for thousands and thousands of years. They are resilient. Whereas if you bring in a 100% ryegrass paddock, let me tell you, the ryegrass will bowl over at the first sign of heat and lack of moisture. And I saw our Ebor farmers, and I call them the urea kings that love their 100% latest species ryegrass, and they spray out their paddocks every three years um, to put the latest species of ryegrass um, in and just fatten it two and a half kilos a day, good on them. But when the drought come, came, they are in negative kilos of beef because I saw bare ground in Ebor, which is unheard of. And that's because they just don't like the native pastures. Whereas without them, we're in trouble. So I'm a big one for as much biodiversity um, within your system as you can possibly encourage. Because when one species bowls over because the conditions aren't right, you've always got another one to replace it. And that's really, really important. And you can take that further into integrating enterprises. I'll talk about that later on. Um, water, yeah, it's great to have high rainfall, but that's not the key. The key is to capture every drop of rainfall that comes out of the sky. So what we do to be able to um, encourage that is you need ground cover. Because if you've got hard compacted um, soils, you're just gonna have the water run straight off into the waterways, over the roadways, eroding what topsoil you had, and that's a very efficient way to go broke quickly and destroy a landscape. So we need to slow water moving through the landscape by having good ground cover always. That's what we aim for. But also in some cases, you know, things like leaky weirs or um, contour banks and really focus on rehydrating wetlands. Um, which has been a massive project at Moffat Falls at, um, at our farm. So as I said, each farm will be different on how they do that. But of course, the biggest key is if you've got, you know, a healthy soil with beautiful ground cover and plenty of pasture, um, that's certainly going to help you on your way. And of course, trees. Trees attract moisture. Uh, so you'll notice places that have Remove trees don't get as high a rainfall as those that still have really good tree cover on their farms. So without trees, you are always going to be that farm that misses out on the rain. Anyway, cropping, uh, if we've got any croppers in the room, the likes of multi-species cover cropping, pasture cropping, pasture sowing, um, all really important in the cropping industry. Multi-species cover cropping, thank God, is becoming um, pretty accepted, sustainable practice. Um, again, not having ground cover, even in a cropping sense, is a no-no because it'll only take one uh, climatic event, be it a dust storm or a rain event, that can annihilate thousands of years of topsoil and turn what was productive farming areas into areas that just can no longer be farmed. And um, I think that finally industry is starting to see that uh, the reality is we need to keep ground covered, even in the cropping sector. I think it's often more easy to talk about what doesn't constitute regenerative agriculture than what does. Uh, paddocks of bare soil, lack of ground cover, I've banged on about that. Monocrops with lack of biodiversity. Spraying out paddocks prior to sowing new pastures or crops. Set stocking, an absolute no-no in any circumstance, um, unless you've got a sick animal that you need to keep in a very small paddock next to your yards, that's different. 
um, overuse of synthetic chemicals, fertilizers, and pesticides. In region world, unlike organic world, we say overuse. And I just want to say that in some circumstances, there is no alternative. If I didn't spray my blackberries at Moffat Falls, I would be just become one big blackberry. And that's the bottom line. So there is no effective means for a property of that scale for me to control blackberries other than to spray them. Now, I have taken the stance of not spraying around my waterways at all. In fact, I'm letting some areas along waterways just do whatever they want to do because it's too hard, too dangerous, and I do not want to destroy the quality of my water, the bird life, or anything else in those very important areas. But in my open areas um, where I, I do far more intensive grazing, then, yeah, we need to control our blackberries. Um, there is no solution for liver fluke. I have to drench for liver fluke. I have no way around that. I cannot fence off 168 springs or whatever the hell we have on our farm. I can't fence them off from the animals. Um, so liver fluke is usually found in wetter areas. Uh, I just have to treat animals, and that's an animal health issue if I don't. Uh, and, of course, over tillage, disturbance of soil, we've talked about that. So back to our operation, um, we have, I guess you could say, three main enterprises. Um, we have a tourism enterprise. We do guided fly fishing for trout. Uh, we do functions. We have a function center. Um, we have cottages and cabins. So tourism is a big part of what we do. Um, as I said, we are registered carbon farmers. So we will do our first trade in 2026 depending on conditions. Um, tricky one for us, um, we actually, people think I'm mad, or probably am mad, but we started uh, with our carbon at 10%, which was the highest registered carbon in the country at the time, and I now have to try and shift that carbon upwards. I think we can do that, and I think we can do that because when we measured the carbon on the outskirts of the treed areas, the carbon was up around 26%. So I've sort of done my figures on trying to increase the carbon by at least 1% using these beautiful hooved animals to, to help me do that job. Uh, but anyway, it'll be, it'll be remain to be seen whether we can, um, but I certainly wanted to give it a go and make all the mistakes, I guess, up front for other farmers as well, so that I can share what to do and what not to do from my own personal journey and experience. Uh, so yeah, there you go. So we have our cattle trading, our carbon farming and our tourism enterprise. And look, for others, it may be that you have, you know, meat chickens or eggs or sheep and cattle, or you might have different uh, classes of sheep and cattle or whatever it might be. I think the important thing is make sure they all support each other because when one isn't so good, the other will get you through um, from a profitability aspect and economic aspect. And can I say Regen is also about being not only environmentally sustainable but economically sustainable and socially sustainable, which means Regen is about looking after our communities and looking after our families. So the people aspects of region are vitally important. We've talked about time control, grazing, holistic grazing. Essential, this is not our farm, but I just thought it was a good picture to demonstrate what it is. This is just with one hot wire where they'd be moving that and moving the cattle. Ideally, it's almost like strip grazing in that case. Um, but yeah, the, the trick is to understand what your carrying capacity is um, and to move those cattle regularly across your landscape. That could be, in some cases, every day. In other cases, every two or three days. There's a whole heap of measuring to know exactly when you should move cattle and experience. Um, but to give those pastures that adequate rest so those more idyllic species can get a bit of a go, go ahead. And, of course, whether you do your grazing charts by hand 
or with a computer system, it's really good to have not only the eye telling you what's happening, so looking forward on where you're going to move your cattle to and looking backwards to see whether that was an adequate graze or not, whether you overgrazed or undergrazed, um, is vitally important. So you need a plan. So you can't just rely on your eye, but you can't just rely on a computer system um, to tell you what's going on either. It's the combination of both that will give you a good response. Okay, here's back to the, um, the compost and the biological control and so forth. What's going on here is I actually wanted to know on our farm what our bio microbiology looked like. Um, we had very high levels of bacteria, as it turned out, that were munching their way through a lot of the microbes. Um, that's just the nature of our environment. But there were so many microbes. I was going to bring in a compost tea. Um, I was going to bring in outside compost. And I actually had my microbiologist say, Lorraine, don't. Because when he grew things, my soil, when he grew things in my soil in his lab, we saw some very interesting relationships going on. And he said, the last thing your environment needs is um, outside microbes to come into what is already a war of microbes going on. So, you know, it's be careful what you introduce. I mean, some properties need microbes introduced because they are, you know, they just don't have the microbial activity that they need to be able to build soil carbon and to be able to grow pasture. But in our case, all we really needed to do was to feed our microbes. And the two things that we've decided to use to feed microbes is fish emulsion, emulsion and um, seaweed extra, extract, just like you'd put in your veggie cat, patch at home. So feed them, don't bring any new ones in. But that's, that's in our situation. Before we do any of that, I believe it is essential to get um, your soil chemistry right. Now, some will debate that a little bit, but I see a really good response um, from correcting my mineral deficiencies. And in actual fact, uh, all of the farmers around Ebor, we put on tonnes of lime every year. You know, one to two tonnes of lime uh, go on per hectare. and that's a lot of lime, that's a lot of money. And the reason we need to do that is because we have very acid soils. Um, and so for plants, plants don't, a lot of plant species don't like growing in, in highly acid soils. So we need to shift that acidity as much as we can. And lime is the king to do that. However, when I did this extensive soil testing, it turned out that a lot of my paddocks didn't actually need any more lime. They needed other things. They needed a little bit of boron or manganese or something else. Um, and, of course, you know, I don't do anything in, in half attempts. <laughs> the bottom line of this little experiment was I was baking a cake for every paddock. And so this is, <laughs> this is my poor little team trying to mix up these concoctions of minerals for every paddock because every paddock, as it turned out, needed something different. I mean, they're beautiful colours, you know, the aquas and the blues, and you've got copper sulphate there. Um, that green one is actually iron, would you believe? And um, so we had to mix all of this. And it was an ex I've got to say, this was quite an expensive exercise. However, it has saved me a fortune in spreading lime. And when I put this into the ground, I may not need to touch these, the soil or put any more minerals on for another two or three years. So when I spread that out, out over time, I'll be ahead of the game here. So I've got the chemistry right. And if the chemistry is right, the microbes will be happy. And then I'm spraying my fish emulsion and my seaweed extract all over the paddocks to really give those microbes a boost. Merry Christmas microbes. And off they go 
they are the ones that produce the most beautiful pastures for us. So there's no planting of species um, on the farm whatsoever. Not to say others don't want to do that. I think one of the most effective ways um, is through multi-species pasture cropping and just sowing in some of those really deep-rooted tap plants like radishes and vetch and all your loosens and, and so forth are a really good way to boost your carbon very quickly if your country can allow you to just virtually direct, well, it's not even direct drill, it's just scratching in um, those sort of deep-rooted seeds into an existing pasture. Sorry, this is not supposed to be an advertisement for the soil uh, soil key renovator, but um, you're just getting the picture of multi-species um, pasture cropping. So, yeah, species diversity, I've banged on about that enough. Um, oh. Better watch my time. And we talked about leaky weirs. Um, I just want to show you the project at Moffat Falls. These are all my springs. And I was very conscious of the fact that I'm running, you know, 800 to 1,000 head across a spring head. And those springs on our farm, I'll just take that down a bit. This is one paddock. Those springs where those blue dots are, those springs feed some of the major rivers in northern New South Wales. So I'm talking about the likes of the Maclay, the Bellinger, the Clarence. When you're at the top of the mountain, you have a huge responsibility for what goes on towards the bottom of the mountain. And so my responsibility is to keep those springs flowing, not have them compacted by hooves, and to ensure the water quality that's coming off my farm is pristine and remains so. So alongside local land services, we have started a program that will probably last my entire rest of my life, fencing off spring heads so that they don't get compacted by large toothed animals and we protect our water source. And it's an expensive exercise, um, but with the help of local land services, we're sort of doing a 50-50 on it and using it as a demonstration site. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, beautiful soil coil there. Got very excited. I would have loved to show you the picture with a really nice big fat juicy worm in the soil core. Um, but carbon is king. That is what we're trying to do is increase carbon, take CO2 out of the atmosphere and bury it back where it belongs, which is under the ground. Um, just a nice picture there. And I think that's it. And I'm up for questions. Thanks, Simone. Have I, how's my timing? I'll just give you a round of applause for Lorraine. Um, oh. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm sure there's lots of Zoom claps coming through there as well. Um, we've got about six minutes questions. So um, we've got time for a couple. If um, you want to, you can pop questions in the chat box. So you're more than welcome to just put your hand up or turn your mic on and um, and ask the question as well. And yes, it's lovely to have Brian um, Wahlberg and Trainee Hill here with us today as well. And I might defer to Brian if you get too technical on me. <laughs> Lorraine, Keith Graham, if I could ask you, you meant I'm a beef farmer too and just starting on this journey, but you mentioned a regenerative meat product. Is that some sort of a certification or like the, the organic beef or? Yes. Um, okay, so I'm quite happy to share that. It's Roots Regenerative. Um is an organisation based out of Queensland who I think is doing some pretty solid work. I actually help them come up with their um, their model. I'm not a big one for certification. I'm just going to put that out there. I don't actually believe there's a place for it in as a regenerative product. However, um, I'm very big on verification, which is what the Holistic Management Cooperative does in their land to market program. Um, I'm very big on verification, which verifies that you're working towards um, a more ecological, sustainable landscape. And like I said, no one ever reaches that end point. But the fact is there's farmers out there that are very focused on shifting their system to be more regenerative. So the 
thing that I did like about Roots Regenerative is they they encompass um, self-assessment in the first instance with verification and then the final stage is a third-party certification over that product. This is a really hard journey in the beef sector. It's a very, very difficult journey um, and I wish them the best in the world to make this happen. Others will follow, but be careful of greenwashing. Um, like I said, I'm a big believer in verification, verifying that you're actually doing certain practices. Uh, I think certification can be greenwashed, but I guess with Roots Regenerative, they've put these three steps together, the self-assessment, the verification, and the certification to come up with this product. Um, so, yeah, something to work towards. And, of course, if you're – if this is – it's early days, but you should be paid a premium for that, for yeah. the extra effort for a better product. End of story. I hope that's answered your question, Keith. Thank you. Lorraine, can I ask you a quick question? And thank you. I really enjoyed that. That was fantastic. Thank you. Um, how are you measuring the carbon? I mean, would you say, I mean, definitely not globally, but in Australia, is there sort of a commonly understood and accepted way to measure it? Okay, yeah, absolutely. Um, good question. Um, first of all, all carbon credits aren't equal. Okay. So I'm registered with the ERF. Mm -hmm. uh, we did um, some 49 measurements down to 1.3 metres over, uh, oh, I've got to remember how many stratas. So each strata had four soil samples taken. Um, so quite, I did it the most rigorous way yeah. I believe you can do it. I mean, this sector is moving very fast. Uh, these points that we took our soil measurements from were based on satellite imaging. So it's, yeah. you are given like, it's like throwing um, specks of paint across a farm. You are given your uh, measuring points. You have no say in this, no say in this at all. <laughs> and then you can move up to, um, I think it's about a metre out of those points. Um, and I think we took three out of the four. So if we could get some nice, the deeper you go, the better. Because the thing about carbon is it becomes stabilised the deeper it gets into the soil profile. So the top levels, the top, say, 30 centimetres, is unstable depending on climatic conditions. But once you sequester it below those levels, um, it, it it's set. You've got it. It's yours. So I can't stress enough that if you're going to go down this path, you can't do it retrospectively. There is no point playing around with sequestering. Well, there is. I shouldn't say that. I'll take that back, Lorraine. Um, if you do increase your carbon levels, you can't go then back and claim credits after the fact. So you may as well register. And if you're going to do this, do it properly. The ERF is the most rigorous system I believe we had have in the, on the globe. And our ERF credits are worth more yep. than other credits so yep. yes you can buy credits from overseas a lot cheaper than you'll get Australian credits um but if you go through the ERF I think it's constantly improving uh they are listening to farmers they are um taking these things on board I can remember when we first started to do it they called my grassy woods land, woodlands a forest and I said, I'm sorry, <laughs> this is not a forest. If I can drive a lime truck through those trees and spread lime, that's not a forest, that's a grassy woodland. But grassy woodland wasn't even a terminology um, in the carbon space at that time because, of course, uh, internationally they would refer that as a forest was a word that came from another country right so it just did, they couldn't relate grassy woods lands it's a very Australian thing uh, anyway to their credit took two years uh, they sorted that um, so I could add more hectares into my soil carbon project 
But yeah, the bottom line is all carbon credits aren't equal. Yep. If you're going to do it, do it right. You can do it yourself. You don't necessarily need an aggregator. Um, we've done it ourselves, but you need a bit of a team of consultants and advice around you. Uh, anyway, that's probably for another another workshop or another presentation, I think, because it gets a bit complex. Great. Thank you. Uh, Lorraine, thanks for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was just wondering if you've noticed an improvement in weight gain and animal performance since you started spraying out the fish and the seaweed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what I've noticed, well, it's the combination of a lot of things. I can't really tell you that I'd put it down to just that because I could also put it down to the minerals that I've put on as well. So I can't say how many additional kilos I would be gaining from putting out the seaweed. All I can do is say that I'm the microbes are certainly happy. Um, if I look after them, they're king. You know, so I can tell you that there's a lot more activity. Um, it it helps with photosynthesis, which is what we're about. That's what we are trying to encourage is photosynthesis. And um I think it's the combination of a lot of things, but definitely weight gain. I mean, one of the ways I can gauge some of these things that we've been doing is that I'm getting more and more of my cattle into that MSA grass-fed kill job, whereas a few years back, not all, well, still, not all our cattle hit the MSA grass-fed kill job. Some end up in the feedlot because they're just not good performing cattle. And when you're trading, you get you get an element of that. But as a percentage, you know, it's increasing every year on how many trucks go out for a killed product. And so that indicates to me I'm turning more cattle off more quickly because of the combination of getting the chemistry and the microbiology right. Not from putting in the latest ryegrass species or covering my farm in urea and superphosphate. Not from those things. And and in any one year, I'll just add to that. Like I like I said, my neighbours are all pretty conventional. And in any good year, they're going to outstrip me on kilos of beef per hectare in any year, as long as it's a good year. But as soon as you get um, variation in the climate where you've got periods of dry, or even periods of far too wet, that's when our yields start to even out. So my yields for my kilos of beef just stay the same, whereas what they get is this, these real ebbs and flows. I'm not going to say regenerative is more profitable than conventional because I'll get burn at the stake for saying stuff like that, but I will say that this is the profitability levels of a regen farmer and this is the profitability levels of a conventional farmer. I can get away with saying that much. <laughs> Thanks, Lorraine. Uh, we've got one more quick one from hopefully quick because um, I know some people have to go um, from Becky in the chat. Um, she just asked Lorraine who determines the kill versus feedlot status. Oh, well, kilos determine, um, yeah, your kilos determine that. So you've got your um, your grids. And really, you need to be, I mean, ideally, you'd want your cattle at about 530 kilos to be killing them because you'll lose some in transit. And then other cattle just won't quite make that. The, the feedlots don't like cattle over 500 kilos because otherwise they're not going to make any money. They're running out of kilos to put onto those animals. So your grids is what determines that. So you need to have a bit of an idea of what, what market am I going for? What is my end result here? I'm not just in the business of running cattle without any end in sight. You know, you really need to have some options, but you also need to say, well, I'm going to head for the, re you know, the premium regen beef market or the MSA grass fed, blue MSA grass fed market or whatever it might be. So that's where you're aiming at. So then you buy the type of animals that'll suit that market knowing all the climate will throw a whole heap of stuff at you and you need a backup as well. Um, but that's probably yet another workshop on trading. 
one of my favourite topics. I love Brady Gaddle. <laughs> Don't like seeing them go off the place sometimes because you know you just you have these cattle come in and they're just like a crazy bunch of school kids when they arrive running all over the place smashing through your fences don't know how to behave and then you hang on to them for say eight to ten months and you just educate them and turn them into these beautiful steers that you just want to give them a big kiss and then all of a sudden they're off in a truck and you've lost them and you're starting over again with a bunch of preschoolers so that's the side of trading I don't like <laughs> Amazing. Um, I'm sure there probably are lots of questions. I know we do have another one, Sarah, but I think we'll have to wrap up now. Just I know people have to go. Um, but I just want to thank you again, Lorraine. Huge round of applause. Um, I know everyone would have taken a lot from that. And I really encourage you to take your questions um to meeting with your mentors next week. Now, some of you are going to meet on farm next week, some of you are going to meet online. Just make sure you're responding to emails and thanks everyone. Love you to see your happy faces. Thank you, Simone. She's frozen. Thanks, She's frozen on mine anyway, but <laughs> <laughs> thanks, have, a good have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Lorraine.